Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Julieta Televi, and joining me to take your questions this evening are Shane Watkins from All Weather Capital and Rikus Regis from PSG Hole in One Rams. So if you'd like to send questions, please email stockwatch at bdtv.co.za or SMS 41392. Uh, Shane, Rikus, good evening to you both. Shane, it wasn't an uh, overall a bad day on the JSC today. We actually um, closed quite strongly positive. I suspect um, some of that had to do with the gains that we saw in um, uh, commodity stocks. And I'm not sure if that was because of the RAND weakening as it did uh, uh, to 1911 or thereabouts against the dollar. But the one stock that I think we have to talk about and start off with, because there's lots of questions about it, is pick and pay. Um, did you see that coming, firstly, uh, a rights offer um, of 4 billion RAND? Uh, Juliet, good evening and uh, good evening to your viewers. Um, so yes, look, I think Pick and Pay have telegraphed that they have uh, that they're trading very poorly. I mean, they've messaged this by changing management. They've got a new CEO, Sean Summers, that has come back to run the business. And I mean, when they reported the interim results, they reported a loss. Uh, I mean, this used to be a large company that has actually become, you know, a, a small stroke mid cap in the JSC. The the market cap now is you know around ten billion, um, and they spoke about doing a rights issue to raise four billion. Um, and of course, you know, the problem with equity markets is that the lower your share price goes, the harder it is to raise capital. So mm -hmm. it's very, very expensive now for them to do a rights offer at 20 Rand, which is, um, I guess, optimistic level to do the rights offer. Uh, and, you know, if, you, if your market capitalization is only 10 billion and you're going to do a four or five billion capital raise, uh, there's going to be significant dilution to the existing shareholder base. Yeah. Okay. The questions from two qu uh, people uh, at least um, are whether or not um, one could uh, dip in now. So is it time to start getting into pick and pay at the current very low share price? I suspect that pick and pay will eventually get through the troubled waters and slowly gain momentum. Uh, so is it a buy or must one wait a bit longer? Rickus, what do you think? Uh, or do you think you actually want more detail on the rights offer first? Yeah. Just more broadly speaking, I haven't been interested in pick and pay in years because they're right in the middle of the market. Um, uh, it, it's, it's just the model. They're either losing um, clients to um, takers or, or Woolworths or down the line to um, to, um, to um shop right. You know, they it's not they haven't got a moat. They're right in the middle of 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 two centres of gravity. If you know. Um, if you want to call it that. So, first of all, they, they need the money just now to um, continue as they are now, and then they've got to change their strategy. That's, that's, that's two huge negatives. So, mm. um, I really am not interested in the mo at the moment in pick and pay, and it might go lower and it might rally from very low prices, but, but in the end, you're still sitting with pick and pay, even if you buy them lower down and you and you have a rally. So, so yeah, maybe trading it, but, but, but investing it, no, not until such time as they... Um, Dem as I suppose demonstrate any sort of turnaround. Precisely, yeah. Um, yeah. Shane, can I ask you about, um, just sticking with pick and pay, uh, what would be the rationale behind raising this 4 billion rand and then splitting off the boxer, uh, the boxer assets in an, in an IPO or, you know, um, unbundling it? Presumably, they would keep the clothing business and pick and pay. But is that a bit like um, in the subprime crisis, sort of bad bank, uh, good banks hiving off kind of the bad mm. bank portion or the good bank portion? Uh, wouldn't you try and keep Boxer if it's such a good operation? Because that might be the, the core around which you build the new pick and pay business. I, 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 I can't really wrap my head around this. So, Juliet, companies' problems exist in two dimensions. They exist in an operational dimension and in a financial dimension. Okay, so Rickus has spoken about the operational problems which they have, which are, you know, I guess, operational strokes, strategic, and then they have a financial problem. So, but to fix the operational problems, they need to fix the operational assets, and to fix the operational assets, that requires capital, mm -hmm. and they don't have capital. Okay. Pick and pay at the moment, they said today they have 7 billion in yeah. debt. So even if they do a 5 billion rand rights offer, um, they're still going to be left with, you know, 2 or 3 billion rands worth of debt. Um, and so I guess 
boxer is the jewel in the crown. I mean, boxer today, they said they grew their, their, their sales um, 15, 16%. The rest of the pick and pay, the revenue was flat. Now, flat revenue is a, is a big problem because your costs are clearly not flat. Mm. Your costs are probably growing, let's call it 10 to 15% in that region. And so if your revenue is flat and your costs are growing 10 or 15, uh, you're definitely making operating losses. And so, you know, the core pick and pay business, which is called it um, 350 pick and pay branded corporate stores, are clearly making huge losses. I would guess 800 to a billion rand a year is the kind of number you can easily pencil in. And so I think that they kind of hung out the, 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 the potential for IPOing Boxer in the hope that the share price would not get um, too badly impacted by the announcement of a rights offer. I mean, Boxer is the jewel in the crown. You wouldn't ideally want to be selling Boxer, but you have to because there's no alternative. I mean, you're choosing from imperfect alternatives, yeah? Yes. And the one that they appear to have gone for is an IPO of Boxer. There was talk that they would find private buyers for maybe a 25 or a 35% stake. Um, but the problem is having so once you've sold Boxer, you still have to fix the corporate business. Now, you've got 300 corporate stores. Um, I mean, at least half of them are probably loss making. It's going to cost you probably 10 million at least a store to refurb. So you're in for a billion and a half on your refurb program, and that will take you a period of years. So as Rika says, you know, I mean, um, even if you had the money, the execution of your turnaround strategy is going to take quite a long time. And the outcome of that is uncertain because of the nature of a very able competitor in the form of ShopRite. Mm. So I guess what I'm trying to artic articulate is that the whole thing is mired in uncertainty at the moment. And I don't think that they would have mentioned the IPO of Boxer except to support the share price while they do a capital raise. Mm. Okay. Yes, that's quite, <laughs> that's quite a strategic move on their part. Um, can I just ask, and, and I'll end off with pick and pay there um, and get on to other questions. Um, were you shocked by the quantum increase in the debt? Because it's, it's up 3.4 billion from August last year. I, I, you know, you think, wow, how did that happen? Um, Rickus, I mean, is, is this what happens? Uh, what do they talk about companies going bankrupt? So it starts slowly and then it happens very, very quickly. Well, Jane spoke about the financial problems, and, and in the end, I think it boils down to cash flow. And there's only three ways you can you can influence the cash flow in a company. That's by revenue, or it's by margin, or it's by managing your um, um, debtors or or creditors. Um, and pick and pay doesn't have revenue, and pick and pay is and as Jane just said, and their margins are are uh, uh, you know sitting out so what you left with very little cash flow to to um, relieve your your own debt levels and what you see is the result that we got today yeah uh, i do think that rickus is right i mean but i do think you know they said the debts i think eight billion um and that is, is an alarming number for a company that only has a market cap of 10 billion yeah so 7.2 billion uh, yes yeah alarming indeed okay um Right, well, moving on, um, there's a question on Tesla. Um, no questions on NVIDIA, where we had lots of those last night ahead of the results, and maybe we'll talk about that at some point. But the, the question on Tesla is, um, what are the panel's thoughts? Uh, too high, good investment, or run for the hills? Um, and the viewer says uh, they're looking for a long-term investment of five to ten years. Uh, Shane, um, going starting with you. So, so Tesla is what I would call a story stock, right? You know, the, the underlying valuation is not related to the company itself. It's related to a narrative. And I mean, there are essentially two narratives running in the, in the global markets at the moment. The one is AI, you know, artificial intelligence. And the other is around the obesity drugs that, uh, you know, are being rolled out by companies like Eli Lilly. So these are the two dominant themes in the market and investors have latched onto them, you know, um, with enthusiasm. The thing about Tesla is that um, it's, a, it's extremely expensive if you look at it in relation to traditional valuation metrics. I mean, I think the add-up value of Tesla, well, the value of Tesla is worth more than the add-up value of every other car company in the world. Mm. Um, obviously, what they are hanging the hat on is self-driving technology and also artificial intelligence. Um, 
you know, at the present moment, that narrative is driving the market. Whether that will continue or not is hard to know. Um, we, we think that Tesla on any <clears throat> traditional valuation metric is expensive, but that doesn't mean the share can't go up further from here. Yeah, I mean, look at NVIDIA. NVIDIA added 15% to its market cap, which is, you know, I guess the equivalent of $150 billion overnight. Yeah. Yeah, an astounding performance. Um, Rick, on, on firstly on Tesla, before we get to NVIDIA, um, you know, do you think the story, as, as Shane says, will continue to to run for quite a while? Because I mean, Tesla has actually had quite a tough year. It's 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 not been the <coughs> it's not been the winner of of the the tech stocks. I mean, and, and I call it a tech stock even though it's a car maker. <laughs> so I mean, you know, it's it's hard to kind of place it. Well, well I think Musk will disagree with you because he considers it a tech um, a tech story. And remember what Musk says: everybody believes, um, at least all these fanboys. Um, okay, technically, if it goes below, I think one hundred and eighty dollars, we've got problem. Um, and it has been a week for the past six, seven months. Um, but I agree with Shane. I mean, it's it's a complete narrative because it's, it's very much um, to the social with, with any kind of valuation you want to put on it. And it's not merely um, the story about the company, it's also the story from Musk himself. And, and um, whatever he says can have a huge effect on what happens with the price. So if you're, if you're very brave, you can go and trade it. But as an investor, mm. um, stock, even with all the miles promises and car promises and battery promises, it's still so dependent on somebody who is very bright but not but not very wise as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to associate what investments with um, a, one specific person that I don't... Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Let's, let's Juliette, maybe the other thing to add is that, you know, for the last five years, Tesla has had no obvious competitors in the EV space. They've been the market leader and they've been the dominant producer of EVs. Um, a Chinese company called BYD is now making more electric cars than Tesla. Mm. So a space that was previously an uncompeted space has now attracted a number of new entrants. And these entrants, certainly in the case of BYD, are now making more cars than Tesla. So they've come from a place where they had no obvious competitors to a market space that's becoming increasingly crowded. Yeah. And you've seen that they've had to cut prices, which has affected their margins. Um, for a manufacturer, Tesla had margins that were almost 30%. Those margins are now 13 or 14%. So as a result of this increased competition, the business has become significantly less profitable. Mm. Just quickly on, on NVIDIA, uh, I hope we didn't bore people to tears last night, um, but they came out with results. Shane, you did mention them quickly. Um, the share price up, what, 15% uh, since the results came out. And the, the numbers were astounding um, if you look at them on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, if, if you'd made gains, uh, significant gains, or if you'd been in, invested in NVIDIA for the past year, and this is what came up last night, uh, and you've done really well, uh, or you're up you know, from the, you know, January and you're up more than 50%, would you maybe take a bit off the table now? Do you think it's getting ahead of itself completely? Shane. Look, yeah, sure. Um, so. You know, there are basically two main ways of investing. There's a valuation-related methodology and there's a momentum stroke growth methodology. And obviously, NVIDIA is a momentum growth story. It doesn't matter what the valuation is. You're buying it based on growth and momentum. And in fairness, um, you know, the it was Q3 earnings that came out. Um, they earned $18 billion in the third quarter, and that was up 200%. Uh, on the prior period. Mm. The earnings were almost 12 times the equivalent earnings of a year ago prior to this AI-driven um, boom. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, if you're a growth investor, I think you would not sell. You would hang on and see. If you're a value investor, you don't own the share. So, <laughs> yeah. so I guess, um, you know, there aren't people that naturally want to sell it, although obviously people would like to bank some profits. And as a fund manager, what you sometimes see in this situation is that the share just becomes too dominant in your portfolio. 
the shares gone up 10 times in the last 12 months. So, you know, if you start out with a 1% position, you now have a 10% position and you may say, well, you know, that just is too big as a risk management measure in the portfolio. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Rick, uh, we lost you there for a second and hopefully we have you back. <coughs> um, technically, well, if you look at the technicals, uh, would you hang in there? I, as Shane said, you know, there's, there's two ways. Um, and I suppose if you're a value investor, you can probably think, hell, I don't like being a value investor around about now. <laughs> um, uh, Rick, is, do, do you think there's, there's, the momentum is, is intact for now? Well, it looks like it, and I, I didn't quite, you know, I, I sort of cut out when um, Tim was talking about value and momentum, and he's dead right. You know, NVIDIA can lose 50% of its value right now, and it's back to where it was in May of last year, um, and it's still in an uptrend. So so that's what you've got to play with. Um, so valuation-wise, who knows? Long-term, I think um, they are at the mercy of their um, of their clients becoming their biggest competitors because they are not going to have the dominance in the market forever. Um, mm. Amazon FedEx is a great example of, of somebody who ships your product and then somebody does it, well, I'll do my own shipping. Same thing is going to happen with NVIDIA at some stage. I don't know when, for the moment, stay with the momentum, but have a kind of a, a trading loss unless you're happy to have a 50% drop in the price without it being sort of going into a down. So it's just managing your position prudently. And while it's not necessary to sell, don't sell, but make, but have a fairly good idea of what kind of loss you are prepared to take from the current price. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, it's it's really a trading strategy combined with, with, uh, yeah, with an the long term value. Okay. okay. Uh, two viewers have sent questions in about City Lodge, which comes out with results tomorrow. Uh, and the question is, uh, it's had a good couple of days at the time of sending at least, probably anticipation of earnings results. It's still greatly depressed from uh, pre-2020 highs in the share price, however. Is the stock primed to rally? Can it reach similar heights again, despite the rights issue dilution and many challenges? Um, Rickus, just staying with you, what do you think? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily contract uh, or concentrate on, on achieving the previous high because that's just a line on a chart basically it doesn't tell you anything mm. um it's the correct tick so even if it as a company doesn't do very well it will get pushed by the fact that your um that the uh um, spectrum is is positive um they've been doing a lot of stuff to change the the uh, the way they make their money. And um, so, so I'm pretty positive on, on City Lodge, just broadly speaking. Yeah. Shane, how about you? Um, would it be entirely unrealistic to expect any sort of um, uh, retracement to previous highs, or at least f for quite a long period of time, given the dilution um, that's occurred as a result of a rights issue in the last three years? Um, Julieta, so just, you know, for the benefit of your viewers, the history of this company is they went into COVID, their occupancies went from, say, 60% uh, to close to zero, and uh, they had a stretched balance sheet. They had to have a very, very dilute of rights issue. The banks kind of strong-armed the management into a rights issue, mm. and the shareholders at that time were completely diluted out. And so the chances that the share gets back to those lofty heights are basically arithmetically zero. <laughs> Um, I mean, remember, the share price got to, I think, 140 Rand. I mean, it's now five, right? Mm. It's never going back there, ever. Um, but, you know, what, what is City Lodge? I mean, City Lodge is, they run 60 hotels. They, the market cap of the company is 3 billion. Uh, the replacement cost of the hotels is probably 7 or 8 billion. Uh, so it's extremely cheap. Um, it's a business that's really geared to occupancies of hotels, and hotel occupancies have been ticking up quite quickly. And um, I think the valuation is quite attractive. Um, I'm frustrated that the management of City Lodge can't see that value themselves. And in their shoes, I'll be buying back my own shares. Mm. Um, and in fact, one of their competitors has been acquiring shares in, in the company. Um, so I think cool. Total Sun so on about 10%. Yeah. They, they own about 10% of the company. And, um, you know, uh, short answer, I think it's a good opportunity. Um, but mm. could do with slightly more, um, let me say, uh, 
innovative management in the sense that hmm. the current management team manage the company reasonably well operationally, but they don't understand capital allocation. And so, you know, there is a risk that someone comes out and um, makes an offer for the company uh, because they can fund it in a better way. Yeah. I mean, uh, is it because, um, and I don't, I, I, I'm just, um, it's conjecture here that the management will say, we'd rather keep our capital for refurbishments or investments into the business rather than into the share price. Is that not a fair, a well, fair strategy? Well, I mean, City Lodge, tra City Lodge trades on a sub 10 PE. A share buyback is obviously earnings enhancing. And how can any investment be a better investment than buying your own shares if you management? Mm. I mean, it's, I've already said that the company trades at probably 50% of, of, of true book value. Yeah. So, I mean, if I tell you, look, yeah, um, you, there's a house in the market for a million rand and I'm going to sell it to you for 500,000. You do that trade all day, right? Yeah. I just don't understand why the City Lodge management yeah. can't see that <clears throat> um, buying something worth 10 rand for five is a great trade. Yeah, okay. All right, well, for those of us long of City Lodge, um, that's, uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. Um, there's a question, uh, actually a, a viewer says, is there a correlation between NVIDIA's stellar results and the number of possible AI related emails I'm receiving? I have no idea, um, but, uh, but I guess AI is here, it has swamped us all. Um, can I ask you both about Anglo-Americans results? Uh, um, Rick is starting with you. The, the share price reaction was fairly positive. Um, the results weren't great, um, and the, the two biggest blots on, on, on the numbers were, as expected, PGMs and De Beers, which went from, what, 1.4 billion odd in profit to 72 million rand. So that was <coughs> an astounding change. Um, Duncan Von Blot was talking about everything being on the table in terms of uh, the, uh, the future for its assets. Does that seem to you like he's suggesting that maybe De Beers is, is going to be up for sale? As I said, maybe diamonds aren't forever. No, indeed. Um, yeah, I'm not just sure about that. Um, it is, you know, the the diamond pocket does go through very much long-term cycles, and I know there's, um, uh, can we call them artificial diamonds, so they <laughs> there's much a lump of coal as, as, as a normal diamond is. Um, and the influence on the market, but it's also tied to the luxury sector, and um, it has gradually become less and less a part of Anglo-American. So, so maybe in that sense, why bother if you if you get a good price for them? There's not that um, historicity in Anglo's being a diamond company as well. Yeah. Um, you know, hasn't gone gone forward. Otherwise. Um, I thought the operational results were pretty decent, considering you know the state of the of the platinum market, as you said, which was one of the big plots on the on the landscape. And unfortunately, that's just what you get when you when you when you buy into a resource company. It's a it's a trading vehicle. It's a terrible business to run. Um, yeah. And uh, if you're not on the right side of the cycle, um, you're going to get hurt. And don't ever invest in it. Just just buy and sell it. Yeah. Shane, do you think it's a uh, time to get into, do you think the cycle's going to turn or do you think there's just too many questions in the air about that and it wouldn't induce you to buy Anglo? So look, the history of, of De Beers is that, um, or of Anglo-American is that they acquired De Beers um, in 20, I think 2001. Um, the diamond business is only 10% of the total NAV of the company now, so it's not a huge part of the business. Um, as Drick has said, you know, the problems really are um, in the PGM business, Amplats, they still own 70% of Amplats. And, you know, we know that the PGM prices, you know, are down like even this year, down like uh, Palladium's down another 10, 15%. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, the short answer is that the beers um, isn't important. There are other opportunities to yeah. unlock value in the Anglo-American stable. They've got a fertilizer business in the UK that doesn't earn its cost of capital and investors hate that they own it. Yeah. Um, they're, 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 there's plenty of opportunity to unlock value in Anglo-American if that is what you want to do. And we do think that, you know, smart management could do that. Yeah. I okay. mean, there's also been talk that, that Anglos could be a corporate takeover target. Mm.
Sorry to cut you off there, Shane. I've got to get your stock picks very quickly from the two of you. Uh, I've run over time here. Shane, what's yours this evening? So I'm punting Pepcorn for the simple reason that I think the most important thing at the moment is to, for shareholders to be aligned with management. And it's quite rare to find a company where management are aligned with you on the JSE these days. And so I'm punting Pepco. The CEO, Peter Erasmus, who I consider to be a competent manager, has got 120 million share options. I mean, to put that in perspective, if he can get the share price to 26 Rand, he'll make himself half a billion. Hmm. I'm sure he's enthusiastic to do that. And if he does that, he'll make us a lot of money too. Yeah. So purely based on the alignment of shareholders and management, we're going with Pepco. Okay. I think it's a great business anyway, but I think the main reason is the alignment of shareholders and management. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rickus, how about you? Um, JV Morgan um, is just a Mac review. One has seen the um, uh, possibility of interest rate reductions getting pushed further and further and further down um, down the year, and higher interest rates good for banks, JPM or JP Morgan in a definite uptrend, break it to new highs. It's not going to shoot the lights out, but I think it's pretty safe in a in what's at the moment pretty volatile global market. Okay, James, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much uh, to Trung, uh, sorry to truncate you there. Uh, Shane Watkins is from All Weather Capital. Rickus Redis is from PSG Hole in One Ramsey. We'll be back with a close up next. <laughs>